For me, this attaches a tremendous personal value to the music recorded on this CD. Today we heard a lot about Jamaican composers and musicians. Names such as Samuel Feldstedt, Noel Dexter, Peter Ashburn or Major Wee Wiley aren't just names to us. We strongly associate them with beautiful oratorios, hymns, operas and other musical masterpieces. A listener can always perceive a message delivered by the language of their music. This language of music is said to be a an universal one, while classical music is mostly known of European composers. It seems odd to me that Jamaican students are learning about, for them, alien composers from Europe, while Jamaica brought forth classical composers itself. I think for music being a universal language, the work of all peoples and all periods should be documented and promoted. Sadly, this is not the case in Jamaica, where a lot of musical heritage is not sufficiently preserved and simply gets lost. Therefore, this symposium was dedicated to promote the work and life of Jamaican composers. That is important from a societal point of view. Cultural heritage creates an automatic sense of unity, which can also, phrase, which can also be phrased as cultural identity. Especially music is important in this regard. Music is history. Music tells tales from earlier times. Music keeps us attached to our religion, traditions and beliefs, which makes it valuable beyond any measure. Therefore, the preservation of the work of Jamaican composers should aim towards making Jamaica's cultural heritage more accessible for everyone. Basically speaking, the value Jamaica's history of music has for its people resembles the personal value this CD has for me. Musical heritage sharpens the image of the ideas and values Jamaica's people had in earlier times. Original Jamaican history should thus be preserved and promoted to protect societal origins and represent a cultural identity. Not only can society as a whole profit from making musical heritage more accessible, young Jamaican musicians could relate to success, success stories of composers coming from their own country. However, in order to achieve this, more efforts in the preservation of Jamaica's cultural assets need to be made. In the first place, this includes the establishment of an institute for musical research that collects and disseminates music written by Jamaican composers. So far, attempts to do so are only made by several individuals, which makes it hard to coordinate and centralize achievements. Besides, original Jamaican cultural heritage should be more integrated in school as well as informal education. By doing so, young Jamaicans are more likely to get concerned about their own cultural past. As for the exploration of the work and life of Jamaican composers that are not largely known yet, everybody can contribute to Music Unite's work. Rosina always is enthusiastic about receiving original songs and music written by Jamaican composers. There really is a need for sustainable preservation of Jamaica's cultural assets, because we have a mighty opponent that cannot be beaten. The time. So let us all together begin now with promoting the medium of music to raise awareness about all the great composers Jamaica brought forth for many, many years. Thank you very much for your attention. My involvement as a composer um, started years after my 
actual entry into music as a player. I played, I joined a military band, Jamaica military band, as an apprentice, and I played in several orchestras around Kingston for many years, in the 50s that is. I joined the band in 1951. And some of the names that you'd know, um, Lord Fly, Maple Tough Pool, Ivy Graydon, and all those, and all the nightclubs that we could find in Kingston. Unfortunately, we don't have many of these clubs anymore. Club Havana, um, Adastra, Bournemouth, um, Glass Bucket. Yes, I played those places, you know. But during my playing days, I decided that playing wasn't enough um, of what I wanted. So I started studying arranging from the University Exten Extension Conservatory in Chicago. And that gave me the push in 1962 when the call was out for a national anthem of Jamaica. And I had the good fortune of being asked to arrange that anthem. And I've followed the performances of the anthem for many years. And of course, there are certain things that I still know are not going right in the national anthem. Some, I think the second line of one verse says that we should guard us, but some people say guide us, right? And there was a performance some years ago which I had to take hold of whenever the military band played in the national stadium and they said Jamaica, Jamaica, boom. That part of it I had to take out because I had the privilege to be the director of music at that time, so I could call the shots and I say no more of this Jamaica boom. So you'll probably hear it being played now without that sound. And to tell you how it came about is that at that particular point, there is just a, a, a light drum roll. But when we go on parade, the bass drummer would give a thud. And so it became a boom on parade, and people, whenever they hear that, Jamaica, Jamaica, boom. But that is no longer the part of it. So that is 1962, and in the same year, I worked with Carlos Malcolm at the opening of the Little Theater, where the opening show was Roots and Rhythms. And I did the arrangement for Madame Sue's ballet, and Punky Rose, um, Jamaican Fruits ballet also. So that was a part of my training of being um, an arranger. Well, I still wasn't satisfied. Um, now in the, in the military band, and I, I asked for a scholarship because I figured it, playing wasn't everything. But at the same time, we had other qualified musicians in the regimental band like Seaforth and Calendar and those people. They were in the army also. And so when I asked for the scholarship to go to England, not knowing whether it's a Royal College or a Royal Military School or where, and they said yes. And they wrote to England, when, uh, Royal Military School of Music, being a military school, and they said, yes, it is a vacancy for a bandmaster's course. But the director of music in Jamaica then was um, a Captain Ted Wade. And so he said, let's have a competition. So it's now four of us, Seaford, Calendar, Toller, and myself. And over three days of competition to find a winner. Out of a total of um, 500 marks, the nearest man to me was eight, um, 80 marks behind me, and that was Seaford. So off I went to England. That is 1965. Right? Now that um, studies in England were for three years, but before you can embark on three years, you have to do six months what we call passing in examination to see if you're fit enough to continue. You're not going to become a bandmaster. And the first class we had, 14 of us, British and overseas. The professor came around, wanted, wanted to test your writing skills. And so he said, British, you write me British Grenadiers. You write me the girl I left behind. You, you write me your national anthem. Piece of paper and your, and your pen, that's all. You got to write from memory and everything like that. And so he walked around and he looked at me and when he saw my work, he said, you used to write music. But that was the start of recognizing that um, there was some sort of talent around the place. Well, six months and we had to do harmony and 
um, composition and theory and all these things, learning about acoustics and you know the different um, things that will make you into a bandmaster. The end of six months, there was this passing in examination, and I came third. So I was on the road, I was accepted, and then after that, we settled down to do music, um, arranging, composition, um, two-part invention, string quartets, and all these things. You have to write them and study. There are my composition skills coming into play now, because you're given four bars of music and to continue for 16 bars. So you will have to write the other um, amount of bars there with your own um, composition skills, imitations, and we know it goes in composition. And so, in addition to that, we know how to learn to play all the instruments in the band, 10 of them, from the flute down to the, the, um, the tuba. Flute, oboe, saxophone, bassoon, French horn, trombone, all of those, you go to a professor for three months, you take your lessons, and then during those three months, you would sit in a band and you play one of the instruments you're doing. At the end of three months, you go in front of the director of the school and you're awarded marks after playing up to a grade four, grade five standard on each instrument. And then we continue doing all we have to do. I had the chance of playing in the director's band, which was 30 of us. The school had 250 students and pupils. 50 training to be bandmasters and 200 as pupils would, would go for one year on a particular instrument and go back home, but we would stay for three years. So during the director's band that I was involved in, I had a chance of playing at the Royal Albert Hall, um, London Philharmonic Orchestra, BBC Light Concert Orchestra, and that's the sort of training that you get in, in um, building your performances. It got to me at, at some time when I, I was now no, no living in London because the school is in Twickenham, and um, I asked could I be, uh, be released from the band. The director said, no, you can't. It's a part of your training. You see how we conduct the programs, and there's where you get your training from. So we continued with that. And then at the end of it, you have your examination where you have to conduct a piece from memory, and you have to conduct um, rehearsal piece. Now these things you have to conduct, they're not, they're not just simple pieces. Phaedro Overture by um, um, things mass, um, uh, things mass name, and you do things like um, the fresh shoots and really heavy work, Beethoven fifth and all these things, that's what you're trained on to do. So conducting is, is, is something that is not just a matter of waving your hand and, and just jumping around with a little thing. It's the art of conducting. There are certain things you do not do. You do not bend the knees, you do not use it, your elbow. It has to be a wrist. When you go, that's what you do. You don't sort of, that is, you know, something to excite but you don't really get um, compliance from the performance, right? That part of it is that at the end of uh, three years coming up, we have to prepare for final examinations. There are seven weeks of examinations. I know it is done. Um, the previous seven years, over three days, those people who graduated, say 1960, you do their paper, 61, you do their papers, until you're year 65, and that is the final year, and that's how you get to be, become a bandmaster. Well, I got some high marks and some not so high marks. The lowest marks was for choral, but um, came third, the beaten by one mark, mark for um, 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 arranging, the instrument, 10 instruments, I came third. That is just tell you the amount of work you had to do. Well, the family joined me while I was there, and we came back to Jamaica, and I was appointed bandmaster, Jamaica Military Band, 1968. And at the same time, I was asked to head the Festival Song Commission, Big Land Bandmaster in charge of festival, military man in charge of this, this thing, you know, excitement in Jamaica. So that went on. And I settled in the band until 19, um, about 74, I became a lieutenant, because the bandmaster is different from a director of music. A director of music is an officer. So unless you're a lieutenant, captain, or a major, or a lieutenant colonel, you're a bandmaster. So, and during that time, the band was really riding high, 
and I was asked on many occasions to take the band and tours for the Jamaica Tourist Board. And we went to Chicago, we went to New York, we went to Minnesota, touring Boston and all these places. And the highlight was to play at the Super Bowl in Miami, Orange Bowl in Miami, 1979, the 13th Super Bowl, and we led the parade. I was up front there with my drum major, and two, two ladies from um, Air Jamaica, with the Jamaica flag and so. That's the high point of it. So, you know, Jamaica Military Band for many, many years gave me the platform to do many things. Then my compositions, I had to compose now because the band requires quite a bit. So every time you go to, to a military parade and those soldiers are marching past the saluting um, days, we call it, and those marches, four of them are my original compositions and three are my arrangements. And um, you'll find that in the civilian world, I have done um, um, about 30 odd compositions. Cara Festa, I did a, a dance at Joyce Campbell, had um, two, about 2,000 dancers in National Stadium dancing in Cara Festa. I was the director of music along with Sonny Bradshaw. And that part of it was that I was the elimination director of music. First, you had to come to me, with your directors from different parts of the Caribbean with their songs, and I did the elimination. But as a military man, I said, look, you have 10 minutes each, three minutes for a simple song, correct it the second time, and the third time is about nine minutes gone, then that's your final, and you're off, next one on. And the elimination took place there with um, Wycliffe Bennett was there, and um, Ted Wade and those people in the, in the um, elimination process. The following day, um, Sonny came with the finalists, and um, that was Carrie Fester involvement. And the piece I composed um, was, was titled Pimento, uh, which was um, merengue and mento rhythm. And a band of, I had a 15 piece band on stage with Tommy McCook and, and all those guys, and it went. But there's a sad thing that happened, which is a reflection on our music. Having played that piece on carried stage successfully, massive audience, that piece was given to a band in the National Stadium to accompany the dancers, I won't call the name of the band, and of course they couldn't play it. And it, it is something that we should pay attention to in Jamaica. We are very short on finding musicians who can come forward and take a piece of music in a, a classical people. The, the pop world. In 1987, Lou Rawls came here, or 83, and he had to, I had to send musicians from the Jamaica military band to go and join his se segment to, to, to perform. And if you look around today, I spoke earlier uh, about in the 50s, the Glass Bucket and Club Havana played for five months, and all these places. We don't have the nightclubs anymore, so we don't have the bands. And what we do now, I did a, uh, some, what do you call it now, not a symposium, notation program some three months ago. And what I learned from that is that um, people don't have a rhythm section anymore in a dance band, like a guitar and a bass and a drum and so. You, have some, you go on the computer and you play something, you record it, and you say that is a rhythm. Hence, you listen to the radio and you find 10 different songs with the same rhythm because it's a computerized thing, which is defeating the purpose of being creative. A musician is a creative person. Instinctively, you compose, or you can go by the rules of composition, and you know what follows. Because while in school, and I said you're given four bars to continue for 16 bars, you'll have to make sure that you know what to do, your modulations, and all the rest of it. What the School of Music is going to do, I don't know, uh, Mr. Williams is there, Roger. Um, if he has any influence at all, we'll have to get back. He knew, I, I taught here for over 20 years. So I, I'm asking that if at all we can find funding to, to get people to come in to read music outside of the schedule of the, the school.